Hello, my name is Ian Shepherd. I'm a mastering engineer and I run the Production Advice website, where my goal is to help you get better results recording, mixing and mastering your music. And Warren has asked me to do a short video showing how I would master the song Stay New that uh, he's been showing you his mixing process for uh, recently. And I've decided to do this entirely in the box using plugins that are uh, for the most part, easily available. And if not, then there's certainly alternatives that you could use that would help you get similar results. And I think maybe two things that I want to say before we start are that, of course, don't feel that the settings that I'm using or the techniques that I'm using in this video are just something you can copy as is. Every song is different. Every song on an album is different. So I use different processing for every song. But I'm going to talk you through why I'm making the changes I am and hopefully give you an insight into the overall mastering process um, so that you can maybe use that and get better results yourself. And the other thing to say is don't go into this expecting some kind of night and day transformation. Uh, you know, the song sounds great already. You know that. You've been listening to the mix that Warren has put together. So I'm not having to reinvent the wheel when I'm mastering this song. There is a fair bit of processing going on, and it is a reasonably involved process, but you'll hear when I get to the final stages that actually my master doesn't sound light years away from the mix at all. Um, and that's very normal in mastering, and I think that's something valuable for you to take away from this video, is that you know it's not all about tape saturation plugins and uh, you know throwing thousands of dollars of hardware at things and this huge complicated process. At its heart, mastering is simple. It's EQ, compression, and limiting. And it's all about what you do, not how you do it, and not how much you do. Um, and maybe on this song, you're going to get to the end and think, well, that's a lot of work. You know, is that a real benefit? Um, and I feel that it is, and I hope you'll agree that it is. But where I know that it becomes a benefit is when you put a whole section of songs together, you know, in a group, be it a playlist, be it an EP or an album, tiny little changes to individual songs can add up to make a huge difference to the overall impression. That's one of the big goals of mastering. It's one of the reasons that I find it so fascinating and satisfying, and maybe you will too. So let's get cracking. So here's the song ready to master. I'm working in Wavelab, but the techniques I'm going to show you will work in any modern DAW. Stage one is just to listen to the song. So let's do that. Your touch is on my mind But I've already written you so many rhymes You're all that I could find But I've already missed you so many times You must be from another world You whisper So immediately I know I'm not going to have to do a huge amount of work with this. This is a great sounding mix already. The levels are reasonably healthy. Uh, the dynamics are already pretty well managed. You know, this is going to be an optimizing mastering session rather than a rescue mission. Um, and to be honest, you know, that's exactly the way that I prefer it. Mastering should be about bringing the best out of the material, not trying to fix things. So, you know, and if I get a master where there is some kind of problem that I think it would be better to go back to the mix stage with, I'll always offer the client that option. The first thing to do is to bring the song up to the right kind of level. Uh, if you were watching the VU meters here, I have the VU meter calibrated to minus 11 dB full scale. That's my own personal preference. I, I like using VU meters to judge loudness. I mean, there's also Wavelab's loudness meter here, uh, but I was trained using VU meters and I still like using them. They're most sensitive in the center region around the zero point. So providing your zero point is calibrated correctly, you're going to notice really quickly whether the levels get too high or too low because they emphasize the importance of that range. So let's take a look and figure out how much we're going to lift the level up by. Now 
So it's going to be a few dBs. Before I do that, I need to enable a limiter right at the end of the chain. Wavelab allows you to put effects onto the clips and also into the master section over here, but I don't do any processing in the master section. I do all my processing on the clips and in the timeline. Um, putting a limiter in here will manage the levels of anything that I play back. I'm using the FabFilter Pro L. The reason I like this is it has a setting called Punchy, which sounds very similar to probably my favorite limiter, which is the TC Electronic limiter that comes with their mastering package. I'm going to talk about that more in a little while. But I find the Punchy setting in the Pro L is a great starting point. I have the output set to minus one dB. That is to try and prevent any possible extra sample peaks being introduced if this song is mp3 encoded or uh, encoded for iTunes or YouTube further down the line and that those extra peaks might cause distortion and also because it conforms with both the ITU loudness specification for broadcast and with the mastered for iTunes recommendation. And I also have the ISP button ticked here in Pro L. That means that if any of those peaks sneak past the limiter and end up peaking higher than minus one, I'm going to see them uh, and be aware of them. So having put the limiter in place, and I always master with a limiter at the end of the chain, although as you'll see when we get to the end of this process, it's barely doing anything for this song, I can lift the level. And I'm going to do that on the clip. So I choose the tab up here and we can see the effects that I have chosen for this clip. Normally I boost the gain at the beginning of the process. Um, in this case, I'm going to boost it at the end, but if I switch that on, the gain that I've chosen for the time being is 3 dBs. So let's just play a little bit of the song with that gain boost in place. So immediately you can see that the VU levels are more respectable now. That needle is pushing up towards zero and sometimes over it. The loudness here has changed from, I think it was about minus 14, minus 15 to minus 12 overall. And if we take a look at what the limiter is doing, this section of the song, it's doing hardly anything. Here comes a loud section. So just maybe a dB of limiting there at the loudest possible moment. So very little limiting and the level is more healthy. Now when I'm listening to the song, I mean the next stage for me in the process is EQ. And the thing that I noticed first about this song was that at the end of the song, which I haven't played you yet, there are some strings which come in that I really wanted to sing. Let me just play you some of that. They're sounding pretty good, but I just I was just sort of like a little bit more sheen, a little bit more gloss on those strings. You know, it's a kind of it's a real classic poppy string pad kind of sound. So let's take a look at the EQ. I'm going to enable it here on the clip, and I'm using the FabFilter Pro Q. I like this EQ because it has a really nice interface and because it's very flexible in terms of using mid-side EQ, which we'll talk about in a minute. Don't feel like you have to use the same plugins that I'm using in this video. I strongly believe that it ain't what you use, it's the way that you use it. Um, there are exceptions to that rule, as we're going to see in a minute, um, but pretty much any digital EQ these days is going to allow you the flexibility to make the kind of changes that I am here. The one exception would be kind of character EQs, like you know something that's an emulation of a, of a classic vintage EQ, where there might be some kind of flavour that the plugin builds in that, that a digital EQ like this wouldn't have. But... That's not what I'm wanting for this song. So the Pro-Q is going to do a great job. So here is the frequency that I first selected for bringing out the kind of that high-end sheen in those strings. Let me play you a little bit of that and I'll switch it in and out. Now that's not a huge adjustment, that's 0.7 of a dB at 5 kilohertz. That was kind of doing what I wanted, but immediately I started to notice that actually then the high end was starting to feel over the top, especially around the edges of the stereo image. All kinds of things at the edges were being kind of 
brought to my attention in a way that I didn't like. And I experimented with a high shelf to tame some of that. Let me just see if I can switch this to a more sensitive scale on the EQ so you can see better. So there's the boost that I added, 0.7. I experimented with a shelf just to reduce the very high frequency stuff there. So, you know, 10k and up, whereas this boost was down at 5k. That was then fighting with the original EQ boost. So what I decided was to come down here in the Pro Q and choose mid-side EQ. And then I click the button here to so that I'm only applying that high shelf filter to the side EQ. Now, <laughs> I did a whole episode of my podcast recently on mid-side processing and Midside is not really the best possible description. So don't be fooled into thinking this EQ is only affecting the edges of the image. It's not that simple. And if you want to know more about that, then head over to my podcast at themasteringshow.com um, and you can uh, learn all the uh, kind of the nitty gritty finer details of, of that topic. But in this case, it has the effect that I wanted. It just takes the emphasis off the really super high frequencies there. It's still, I'm still hearing that uh, improvement in the sound of the strings that I was looking for, but it's not over the top. So I'll just play you a little bit with that switched in and out. It's the hi-hat in particular that was catching my ear without that EQ in. And so with those two EQs balancing each other, uh, it's working much better. But almost as soon as I start listening to that, I'm now thinking, well, I could do with a bit more weight in the kick drum. So the EQ that I settled on was this. And that's adding in a lot of extra weight down in the kind of the, the sub-region of the kick. Let's see where that frequency... That's down at 40 hertz. So there's not a huge amount happening that low, but this part of the EQ curve here, where you really start to hear some of those frequencies being active in the kick drum sound, is the bit that's going to have an effect. And I, I, you might be wondering why I wouldn't put that EQ higher. The problem then is that this edge of the curve will then go up into the even higher frequencies and start to muddy things up. So I'm I'm kind of boosting lower than I need to, where there isn't a huge amount going on, just to get the shape of this EQ right as it kind of lifts out those low frequencies. But now I'm starting to hear something that doesn't really relate to EQ. The level is roughly where I want it to be. The EQ is improving, but I'm starting to feel now that, especially with this extra boost down here, the whole the beat. There isn't a technical term for this. For, for, for want of a better word, I would say that it's starting to sound a bit stompy. It's a bit of kind of a dum cha, dum cha, dum cha. And, you know, there's a real dancey element to the guitars and the, the, the feel of this track that, to me, that I want to bring out. So, you know, I, the last thing I want to do is make this sound kind of more plodding or uh, kind of thumpy, if you like. And the solution I'm going to use for that is to use some compression to shape the, the, the impact of the kick drum especially. I think it's also going to have the effect of gluing the mix together a little bit and just making the whole thing flow a bit better, making it move a little bit more fluidly. And this is where, I know I said earlier that it ain't what you use, it's the way that you use it, but in this case, the process that I've chosen is the TC Electronic MD3, which I have running on a PowerCore hardware processor Firewire card. Unfortunately, you can't get this anymore, so I feel bad using it in this video, but I started out using the FabFilter Pro MB, which I like. It does a great job, and usually I can get really great results with it. I just, I wasn't getting exactly what I wanted, and, and this is an old favourite of mine, so, you know, I kind of, I got to a point, I thought, well, let me just check, and I, I went back, and sure enough, the MD3 is doing exactly what I want it to do. Now, this could be to be honest, I've only started experimenting with the Pro MB fairly recently. There might well be some fab filter uh, ninjas out there who could replicate the, the effects I'm getting with the TC here. I wanted you to hear what I think sounds really good for this song, so I'm not going to make do 
with the other processor, but I'm not necessarily saying there's any kind of magic mojo in this compressor. I've used it for over 15 years. I know it inside out. I, I know how to get the results I want with it. It's a multiband compressor. I like to use multiband fairly regularly in mastering because I can get more transparent results. I can get more control of the dynamics without obvious side effects of compression, but I tend to use it as unobtrusively as possible, meaning that I only use three bands. I use wide bands so that the effect is as much like a single band, a broadband compressor, you know, like a, like a bus compressor might sound, but with the benefits of the multiband processing. And there isn't time to go into the kind of multiband processing that I'm using in detail in this video. Head over to my website, productionadvice.co.uk, if you want more information about that. There's a, several posts there if you're interested in this topic. So let me just show you the difference that the multiband has. That's fairly subtle. I've got it set up so that when I bypass it, there's no level change, so you don't get fooled by a change in loudness into thinking that it sounds better or worse. But hopefully you can just feel that without it, it's... Especially with that EQ that I had in the low end, it was starting to feel a little bit stompy. It's starting to sound a little bit lumpy, <laughs> is the best word that I can come up with. Um, Whereas with the compression, it has more flow. Uh, it ha it's, it's a more fluid, and it feels more dancey to me. Now, the thing about putting in a compressor is that that, to some extent, is going to work against the EQ that we have. I like to work this way, EQing into a compressor. Um, but that means we're probably going to have to come back and tweak some more things here. So let's take a listen now. We'll go back to the end and listen to the effect of the compression and the EQ together. Now I'm feeling that overall it's starting to sound a little bit thin and a little bit toppy. And I experimented for a while and the solution that I came up with was to add in a low shelf and that low shelf is oh that looks huge okay that's because i have the eq scale zoomed in so that you could see the high frequency stuff okay that looks a little bit more sane so that's three dbs with the crossover point at 244 hertz um, but you can see that it stretches up here well towards the one kilohertz region so that's a general low frequency lift so let me show you the difference with that enabled and disabled. The change might not be as big there as you might expect to hear from a 3 dB boost, but that's because, remember, to some extent, it's working against the compression. And I'm sure you've found that yourself. If you apply EQ before a compressor, the effects that you hear of it can often be less than if you apply that EQ after the compressor. And actually, if anything, that applies even more with multiband processing. So that was helping in warming up the low end and Again, I kind of feel like the glue that the compression is adding to the mix overall, that's all beneficial. I'm liking all of that. But now I'm concerned that actually I'm kind of pushing this towards a bit of a smile EQ where I'm pushing the bottom and the top and the mids aren't working and especially that the vocal might not be as full or coming through as well as it used to. So the solution that I came up with that was to add this EQ here, which is at about a one kilohertz and is a 2 dB boost. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, <laughs> the overall shape, I mean, you can see here, I've got, I'm starting to lift 
a lot of the frequencies, not all of the frequencies, but quite a few of them by two or three dBs. And maybe I should start taming things. That's that's a fair comment. I'm just being honest about the process that I went through when I was mastering this song. And in a minute, I'm going to show you a before and after comparison with the EQ. And the nice thing about the Pro Q is that we can adjust for the overall level change, um, which helps with that. But I tend to treat EQing and, and the mastering process in general as a bit like, you know, peeling the layers from an onion. You go for the, the kind of the outside scraggiest, ugliest bit and you peel that off and then you see there's a little kind of blemish on the next layer and, and every layer you go in you get a more and more perfect onion and it's just what catches your attention next so is this the most logical way of EQing this song not necessarily is it going to get me a result that I'm happy with yes hopefully so let me play you an example with and without that EQ So that works. That really fills the mix back out for me. I still wanted the vocal to cut through a little bit more. So I came in with this little tweak here. That is a 0.9 of a dB at three and a half kilohertz, just to help that vocal cut through a little bit. So I'm pretty happy with that. I did a final few tiny little tweaks. Um, I'll just briefly show them to you. They're down here. I have two little notches. That's minus 0.3 of a dB and minus 0.3 of a dB again at 165 and at 231 hertz. Those were to just take about a little bit of kind of a build up that I was hearing in the snare. Um, I've got this quite broad low shelf boost that brought up everything in this region quite a bit. Um, I wasn't unhappy with those frequencies originally, but now listening to it in context with everything going on, I just felt that the snare was getting a little bit thick at those frequencies. When I had taken those out, and you'll notice they're both mid-only cuts, I didn't want them to affect anything at the edges of the image. They're only going to um, affect what's in the center of the image. I also then added a tiny little compensation in the other direction, slightly higher up again. And those are the kind of, I think those are degrees of taste really, and people might take them or leave them. I have found tiny little changes to that to be incredibly important sometimes in the mastering process. Um, whether anybody else in the world would ever hear them or notice them is hard to say. Let me just quickly give you a preview. I should be able to enable and disable just those three EQs. <laughs> In fact, the overall effect of those is to add a little bit of weight to the snare, I think. And now I think about it, it's been a while since I mastered this song. Perhaps I added the boost first and then the cuts to tame it. The boost is a mid and side boost, so it's a kind of normal EQ. Um, the other two are mid only. And actually, listening there, switching it in and out, I really did feel there was a really worthwhile benefit to that, even though those changes were so tiny. So I think that's quite a good example of how small changes can be important. It'd be interesting to know whether you feel the same way. And now we're getting very close to where I considered this song to be finished. I'm actually going to move across here to... It's exactly the same thing, but it has all of the final processing. And I'll just describe to you the other tiny little changes that I made. The first thing was that you noticed there was quite a big EQ boost overall there. That was causing a shift in the level. It's not good to run the MD3... The TC Electronic too hot, so I have a level reduction here of one and a half dBs going in to make sure that I wasn't clipping the input to that. And the other thing I was noticing listening was that the final effect of all of those EQs that I had felt to me like it was making the mix a little bit too wide. 
a little bit too uh, out around the edges. I wanted a little bit more focus in the mix. And the solution that I came up with there was to use, and this is uh, the Wavelab Stereo Enhancer. I'm actually reducing the overall width of the mix ever so slightly using that. It's very subtle. I like the overall width of the mix that Warren has, but with the changes I was making, especially the, the mid-side element of those changes, I felt that needed taming ever so slightly. Let me show you what I meant about the overall boost in the EQ. If I just bypass the whole EQ for you, You can hear how much difference it's making. The nice thing about FabFilter is it has this automatic button here which will compensate for the level changes so you can do a loudness matched comparison of your EQ. The only problem with that is that I made those EQ choices in conjunction with the multiband dynamics processing. And remember, I was saying that the compressor was working against the EQ at some points. So there's very much uh, a close relationship between the compression and the EQ. You know, this is a, a, a fundamental paradox of mastering. If you change the loudness, it changes the way that we hear the EQ. That's the root of the loudness wars, effectively. But in the same way, if you change the EQ, it changes the way that we hear the loudness. So the mastering process I very much see as a kind of, you choose the level, you adjust the EQ, you balance the dynamics, then you listen again and you go round that process again. You go round and round and round in circles effectively, but hopefully you get closer and closer and closer every time to the final result that you're aiming for. Now, there isn't an easy way for me to bypass both the EQ and the compression together. And back in the day, I would have made a copy of this clip, disabled all of the processing, matched the levels manually, and done a loudness matched comparison between the before and after for the song that way. Um, as a shortcut, in this case, I'm going to use my Perception plugin. Let's just enable that. That allows me to bypass all of the mastering processing in one go. But of course, everything also gets louder. So the really important feature of the Perception plugin is that it allows you to balance the before and after levels, compensate for that loudness difference, and listen to them loudness matched. So let's try that. Now, you might have thought there was quite a big difference between the mix and the mastered version just now when I bypassed everything. Now that they're loudness matched, you're going to hear that it's much more subtle. Hopefully you can also hear all the other things that I've been talking about. To me, even when they're loudness matched, the mastered version just has a little bit more flow to it, a little bit more of a dancey feel. The mastered version has a deeper, fuller, richer bass. Uh, those strings really sing out without catching your ears or being distracting or harsh. The vocal is there. Everything's working well. And you saw I was just checking with my Dynameter plugin here as well. This gives me um, a measure of the dynamics of the song. And it's right about where I want it to be. The overall PLR, peak to loudness measurement for the mix, is 12, which is going to work fantastically well for YouTube and other online platforms. Uh, the minimum peak to loudness is 8, which is 
about as low as I think you can go whilst keeping really great dynamics in a mix. That's my own personal rule of thumb and recommendation. So there we go. I think the only other thing to show you, you've probably noticed, I have some little bits of automation there. Let me just play those to you and see what they're doing. Already missed you so many times. You must be from another world. So there, I'm being a bit cheeky. I'm lifting that snare hit by 0.7 of a dB. Uh, can anybody hear it? Who knows? It seemed like a good idea to me. This adjustment here is interesting. I felt like I wanted to retain the contrast between the verses and the choruses, even with the extra processing that was happening, especially the impact when the chorus comes in. Um, so I have reduced the level there of the verse slightly in comparison to the chorus. Not a huge amount, half a dB. It's just hitting the compression and the limiting half a dB less for that section of the song. Um, but I actually kept the level up after the end of the chorus. I tried this change earlier on in the song um, and it just seemed to lose energy to me. So I picked a point where that transition seemed to work really well to me. Let's play it to you and see what you think. And I've got something similar happening later in the song. Uh, this, I think, is lifting out a tom roll, if I remember correctly. Just little things that I liked that I wanted to bring out. Um, I'm also noticing as I'm listening to it, there's a few clicks in the vocal there. I had intended to go in and use probably Isotope RX or something to just take those distracting little clicks out there. So this song is not quite finished yet, but hopefully that gives you an idea. Like I said at the beginning, maybe the changes aren't as huge as you might have thought, but I think they're subtle and important. And what I find in mastering, what's fascinating to me is that little changes like that over an EP or an album, a group of songs, even though the tiny little changes individually, they're all important and they all add up to something that is much greater than the sum of its parts. I hope you agree with that. I sent the master to Warren. He says he loves it. That's the goal. That's my objective achieved. So there you go. I hope you found that uh, interesting or useful. Um, I hope there are some ideas in there that maybe will help you uh, get better results if you're trying to master your own music. Of course, you know, if you want the absolute best, I would always recommend that you go to a professional mastering engineer um, because of their experience um, and because of the value of a third party perspective. It can be really hard to master your own music, especially in the same space that you recorded or mixed it, but it is possible and it's fun. And if that's something you'd like to know more about, then please head over to my site. Um, Warren is going to put some links underneath the video so that you can check out. I have some info products that go into this in more detail. Uh, there are a ton of free videos on my YouTube channel that you might find helpful. And of course, there are my plugins that you might be interested in as well. So there you go. Uh, thanks for listening.